so um, being a doctor over 50 years and during that time I learned increasingly about the power of research and audit and accumulating evidence to really to answer your questions, to address problems, might be service problems, and to evidence uh, these for additional resources. So I was firstly a consultant physician for 13 years in a hospital which had a significant medical research council presence. And this meant that actually research was integral to the life and the work of the hospital. Then I subsequently trained in public medicine. And thank goodness, during that time, I found my natural habitat, uh, my natural habitat being prisons. Um, so almost 30 years ago, I joined uh, the prison services directorate of healthcare. At that time, prison healthcare was outside the Department of Health and the NHS. The health services for people in prison was provided and funded by the prison service. So the motivation for this study started a very long time ago. And really it's because I saw something that worked and quickly applied uh, later on. So in 2004, Treasury allocated 46 million for the implementation of prison-wide evidence-based services for substance misusers. Two pieces of research were important. They previously shown, um, colleagues at the Institute at Maudsley had shown that naive prisoners leaving prison were 40 times more likely than their parents to die of an accidental overdose in the first week. Then, a prison subset of the National Confidential Inquiry into Suicides and Homicides showed that substance misuses deaths from suicide peaked in the first week of the coming prison. So you have to ask yourself why? And the answer was well, that a comprehensive evidence-based service was lacking across the prison estate. An additional event was the looming, a looming class action against the Home Office on behalf of 160 prisoners who had had a rather inadequate treatment of their substance misuse. Um, this was before we got the money, um, but later they won. So I say never ever fear a legal challenge um, because it's not only professionals who can make a difference. And as soon as the service got uh, implemented across the prison estate, Suicides fell dramatically amongst the substance misusers. So the sex, second thing you do is if any, if you get additional resources, always quantify the impact so that they can't take the money away from you. So I also noticed that twice as many people uh, would died from deaths categorised as natural than died from self-inflicted deaths. So I started looking at individual prison probation ombudsman's fatal investigation natural death reports. But then I soon realized that how would be greater if a greater number were analyzed. So in 2012, I helped PPM flourish a report on 130 natural deaths, and then we later followed up with 115 from uh, certain disease. Some of the findings were similar to those of today. In retirement, I was surprised to notice a one-year 30% increase in natural deaths between 2015 and 2016. So it was back to the drawing board at home in my study, uh, looking at the reports, and I became ever more acquainted with the conclusion Care was commensurate with that in the community. Then in 2019, there was a man whose death made a, a significant impression on me. He was a 35 year old man who uh, 
suddenly became developed a, a very hard, far, fast heart rate at night. He'd been short of breath over the previous week. It was clear the night staff were unsure what to do, and particularly um, in the light of this report, they didn't have any early warning scores so that they could assess him immediately or monitor his condition. They had no senior colleagues to refer to as they were unsure. If they had, then he would have been admitted that night to hospital. He went next day and was found to have an infection of his heart, um, the heart muscle, a viral myocarditis. But twice, he was swiftly discharged back to prison. The second time, an echocardiogram and an MRI scan showed that his heart was expanding and the, the, the muscle was uh, contracting and poorly, so his heart was failing. He returned to prison and was found dead. It was a few days later. His death was far from inevitable, and certainly it could have been avoided, but even so, whatever that, he should never have died in prison. So suddenly, and it was suddenly, I was standing in the kitchen making a cup of coffee and I thought, hmm, and it became clear. I'm still registered as a doctor with the GMC, a duty of candour, because if I'm concerned about public safety. So then, being retired, I'm not accountable to anybody, so I can sort of do, do my own thing. So my journey, my journey led me to Ensipod and Marissa, who has, uh, Marissa Sayers was interested in the study. Um, we then approached uh, Jennifer Dixon, Chief Executive of the Health Foundation, as we could see that my proposal man, uh, matched at least two of the Health Foundation's purposes, that of supporting healthcare improvement and providing evidence and analysis to improve healthcare policy. Jennifer was incredibly encouraging. Um, Marissa and I worked together on the grant application. I really cannot thank uh, Jennifer and the Health Foundation for their funding and for their encouragement. So I'm thrilled. The report today is even better than I ever anticipated. And I do know that sound data can make a difference. So sometimes you have to be persistent, passionate, Dare I say the tedious Brit in the oyster? Find a way to obtain the evidence to use established data rather than emotion to convince others that change is necessary. My hope that's where we are today. So thank you all, and I look forward to the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Mary. That's really that's a really lovely uh, openness to the, the where you say it's about emotion, but there's clearly quite a lot of emotion and passion in there. So so thank you. And if it wasn't for your drive, we wouldn't be here. So thank you. And um, I'm now going to hand over then to Vivek, who's going to uh, start us off. Thank you, Marissa. Um, and um, so the plan, as I mentioned, is to just give you an overview of what's in the report. There's lots of detail which we can't cover today. But hopefully we'll give you a flavor of some of the key findings and themes from the study and its report. Um, so I'll just give you a quick run through the methodology. Um, as with all NC port studies, uh, once the proposal is approved, we get together a study advisory group, which is comprised of uh, experts from, uh, from every aspect of that field. Uh, it's a mixture of clinicians, um, sometimes academics, but more importantly, service users, volunteers, and every other person whom we think will be instrumental in designing a study that will measure what we want to see. So I'm really thankful to everybody who contributed, either as the study advisory group member or as the reviewers, because once they've designed a study for us, we then create a case review process, which uh, uh, takes us through the whole study. So just a few things here. Uh, the plan was to uh, review natural deaths, so people who died of natural causes as defined in their uh, reports, and also people who died of other non-natural deaths. Uh, and the total numbers we had over the period of 2019 and 20 
was 198 natural and 49 other non-natural deaths. As you see in there, we had to dip into some cases from 2018 for uh, the non-natural group. Uh, the process thereafter was to have a peer review of these notes. Uh, one from case notes, and again, we're grateful to uh, England to provide uh, access to these anonymized data and for their NHSE clinical reviews. In addition, uh, the PPO, fatal incident reports and action plans were also reviewed, in, both with the purpose of learning from process of care and death and review of death. We also then undertook a healthcare practitioner survey and uh, grateful to all the clinical uh, staff members who took part in it. Uh, a significant majority were doctors and nurses, so about 17% were GPs, 30 odd percent were registered nurses, and about 10 to 12% were registered mental health nurses, and then also a mix of other professionals who are taking part in prison healthcare. Uh, all this data was then looked at from a thematic analysis. Uh, all patients obviously sadly had died uh, in prison or in hospital uh, from prison. And we were looking backwards to see what were the lessons we could learn in the process of care, so in the clinical pathways, and then develop some recommendations, which again were reviewed by our case reviewers, our study advisory group, uh, to make sure that we had uh, represented the care that uh, the prisoners had received. Um, so from here onwards, we'll just cover four themes and uh, again, give you an idea about what's in the report. There's much more and we certainly cannot cover everything. Yes. Um, but hopefully we'll, we'll have some of that discussed in the question and answer session also. So one of the uh, key findings was around long-term conditions. Uh, you might have seen, or those of you who are uh, looking at the BMJ, today there's a press release which talks about how, while we might use terminology like natural cause of death or other natural cause of death, uh, these patients tend to die at an earlier age, almost a decade earlier than for the same condition if they were in the community. So we might label them natural deaths, but there is something not so natural about that. And so one of the things that stood out very much was about long-term condition, uh, which were uh, unsurprisingly in those with natural deaths, as you see there, 87%, but also in non-natural deaths who were usually younger patients and had 54% of them having long-term conditions. And again, that is not common. Young people should not be having that many long-term conditions, uh, but they did. Um, 51% were identified to have new long-term medical conditions during their clinical assessment. And as you know, uh, anyone who comes into a prison system gets uh, uh, clinically assessed at two different stages soon after their arrival. There are challenges and a lot of detail in the report around the timing of these assessments, the resources available, what can be realistically achieved um, in that period of time. But identific uh, identification of long-term conditions, as, as was very obvious, is an important part. New conditions were identified, but there were challenges around then monitoring them and also making sure the, the appropriate care plan was put into place. So an example that we provide in the report is about this elderly gentleman with advanced lung failure who came into hospital with acute chest breath, failure and heart failure, uh, which required treatment and then was returned to prison. But case reviewers felt there was still for improvement, in, both in terms of uh, timely review of the condition and also medication management. There was definitely more that could have been done for this patient. And there were similar examples for patients with other long term conditions which may not have been related to their heart. And you'll be hearing more about that later on. Uh, in terms of appropriateness of investigation and need for further follow-ups, uh, here is a, a graphic from the report where you can see that uh, people who uh, think magenta uh, uh, had um, appropriate investigations were received, but almost 30% did not. 
and there was further scope for improvement in about 40 uh, percent of patients. Um, I think I'll pass you over to Mark to carry on with the next thing. Yeah, thanks, Vivek. Um, so Vivek's talked about long-term condition management. So I'll just say a few words about uh, acute care and, and deterioration. And as we'll see from the top of the slide, deterioration prior to death was really common, occurring in just over two thirds of the cohort that we examined. Um, and the National Early Warning Score, the NEWS 2, um, have been recommended as a, as a tool to use to monitor patients' physiology um, to check whether they are deteriorating. Um, and it was used in just over half of the patients that we studied to assess them, and actually about 40% as well, it was used to monitor them. So new scoring in prisons is relatively commonplace, but in the people where it was used in just over uh, returned, uh, there was room for improvement in how it was used. And then the number that's on the, on the bottom of the box at the top of the screen, just under the third, um, the, in the whole patient cohort, early warning scoring would also have been improved. Um, the case history that you see below is an example of how our reviewers felt that early warning scoring might have helped to change the outcome. Um, and I won't read the words on the, on the screen, but I'm sure you'll have read them by now. And there were plenty of examples of where early warning scoring could have been, could have been used and been helpful. In addition, while I'm talking about deterioration and, and acute care, just a mention of the fact that um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation was performed in 50 patients in the study. Um, one of those died from a natural death and 19 from an, an other non-natural. And um, just to be clear, other non-natural refers to deaths that are not on the title of suicide uh, and generally actually is due to drugs mostly uh, the not psychoactive substances. So uh, we found that uh, cardiac arrest occurred, cardiopulmonary resuscitation was offered in, as I say, in 50 patients, and there was lots of room for improvement. In particular, bystanders um, didn't start CPR because often prison staff weren't trained in CPR, and we feel that that would be a very easy thing to start moving forward to improve care in that situation. Um, we put one graphic in here, which is um, a bar chart of, uh, Vivek talked about the themed analysis that we undertook. And what we wanted to do is to try and understand the different pathways of care that, that are in place uh, for the different types of conditions. So we grouped the causes of death. Uh, you can see the five uh, groups here, malignancy, advanced chronic disease, infection and acute cardiovascular disease, as well as drug-related deaths, which effectively is the other non-natural deaths. And what this shows is that this is a, a chart of percentage room for improvement uh, in each of those groups. And it shows that there is more room for improvement in early warning scoring in people with infections or acute cardiovascular causes of death, so people with more acute illness. But there's still plenty of room for improvement in the monitoring of physiology of patients who die from advanced chronic diseases and even those who die from malignancy and, and drug-related causes. So plenty of room for improvement. I will hand back to Vivek uh, to talk about the third point. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, uh, moving on to another important aspect, which is covering significant detail, uh, obviously, is our uh, uh, clinical deterioration in, in prison, and then transfer, uh, usually an emergency transfer uh, to hospital. There is uh, uh, quite a good discussion on planned assessment in hospital, that uh, things like spe specialist outpatient reviews, but we'll leave that for the report for you to read. Um, so looking at emergency hospital transfer, you'll see that uh, almost two third patients uh, in the year before dying required an emergency transfer. Um, and case reverse found that about 17% uh, were preventable or avoidable. And there were signs of prior deterioration at about 60%. So potential identification and prevention uh, in a large again of concerns of these patients. Um, what this is also trying to highlight is 
if we go back to previous talk about long-term conditions, whether they are cancer-related, non-cancer-related, that these long-term conditions, if they're not monitored and treated, will potentially result in acute deterioration that then means utilization of the complications that come with it. Um, the other end of the uh, emergency admission and potential death thereafter is uh, people who were older, had multiple comorbid conditions, who were progressively getting unwell, could potentially have been identified for an interval in the life care, whether in the context of cancer or, like the example mentioned here, advanced heart failure. And this reveals the need for further uh, look into this aspect of care where our prison population is aging and they have more than one medical condition. It's probably also useful to highlight here that compared to physical health care uh, management, mental health care services seem to be better organized in the cases that we were studying, uh, both in terms of policies and processes, although there was definitely scope for improvement in there also. So things like uh, not, not for resuscitation orders, thinking about involving family members and the patient in making such decisions, uh, collaborating with palliative care and community, community teams to come up with a robust plan that would work. Equally for emergency transfers in cases where it was very clear that in future they might need emergency transfers, having a good plan in place in advance rather than having to react to an emergency was one of the things highlighted in the report. Now, here's another graphic about management before hospital transfer. So, talking about all the things I just touched upon uh, in terms of patient deterioration in days before transfer, so not just hours, but days in uh, a large number of patients. Uh, similarly, earlier assessment or intervention could have prevented transfer. And as you can see, uh, in about 30% of patients, we could have prevented that transfer. And emergency transfers always are more risky. And then finally, deterioration that could be managed appropriately prior to transfer. So another 30% or so where it was not, and it could, could have been done better. Back to you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Vivek. Um, yeah, and, and then, so the, the other thing that was rather different from what we've done before in, in NCPOD studies, where we normally examine clinical pathways, as we've just been describing, the other thing that we did was that we were uh, able to review the well the ombudsman's reports, which, as Mary's already alluded to, these are freely accessible. You can access any of them uh, after a death in custody. Uh, but we were also really lucky that NHS England supported us with providing the clinical reviews so that we could examine them and we could rate them. So we uh, were able to look at these and find that. Um, again, as Mary suggested, if you look at the cases and amalgamate them together, the, uh, the opportunity to learn from these cases is enormous. I guess I always think about this when I open a set of case notes in a hospital, there is always something to learn. And from our review of both the clinical reviews and the case notes, we found that there was, well, you can see it on the screen, in more than half the cases, there is something that can be learned. And um, having said that, uh, when the PPO reports uh, were uh, were created, uh, there were just under one in five of them where there were no recommendations made. And the illustrative case that you can see on the screen is an example trying to summarise the sort of thing that when we read through the case notes we find, and yet where this type of case didn't have any recommendations made. Um, part of that will be due to the restriction on the terms of reference for the review, which is supposed to focus purely on the cause of death. But it feels like there's an awful lot of opportunity to learn more widely about things that could be improved in prison healthcare when we're looking in depth at uh, clinical cases of people who have died in prisons. Um, so, the other thing I was going to just going to say was about um, so this chart is about the the percentage room for improvement in the clinical reviews. So it's over the top 
the percentage of people who answered no are, are reviewers who answered no to a particular question. So this shows that um, there is a lot of room for improvement in how the reviews were done, whether the reviewer had the right sort of expertise, whether they involved other appropriate specialists in doing the review, and then whether our reviewers agreed with the conclusions and the recommendations that were made. Actually, the striking thing about this is that there is much more room for improvement in the natural deaths. And the natural deaths uh, occur in these people who, as Vivek was saying, have a low comorbidity, who have much more medical complexity in their clinical pathways. And so um, there, is, there is certainly something to be done to try and learn more from these cases as we move forward um, and do something more systematic to share the learning across the whole business state.